yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers. Yeah, uh, I'm so sorry for being late. It was Andy's fault. <laughs> he sent me an invitation for the wrong hour. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Sipo. Uh, I work for Amazon. I'm um, going to uh, spend a lot of uh, my... Uh, I have spent a lot of my time working on analytics. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, services I'm very close at uh, with uh, is Amazon Redshift. Uh, and this talk is going to talk about the evolution of this service the past 10 years. Um, if uh, you are taking Greg Ganger's class, uh, I did pretty much the same talk uh, last week uh, for Greg's class. So uh, some of you, you may want to just skip the class, okay, skip this talk and, and do, do other stuff. You only have three students, you're good. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, all right, so that is probably will be the only marketing slide I will have. But uh, uh, Amazon Redshift is uh, uh, Amazon's uh, cloud data warehouse. It is a very large service. Um, we're kind of very careful when we make public statements. So, and we have gone publicly and said that you know daily we have tens of thousands of customers using Redshift to process exabytes (plural) exabytes of data in AWS's global infrastructure of 30 regions and 96 availability zones. Uh, so this is a massive uh, system, uh, you know, and, you know, since, since it's already 2 p.m. in the East Coast, you can uh, safely assume that for the day we have had, our systems have processed, uh, you know, at least one exabyte of data, uh, if not more. So th this is a very, very, very big system. And uh, our goal is to be uh, easy, secure, and reliable. Uh, we need, we want uh, customers to be able to analyze all of their data using uh, Redshift, uh, data that are complex, either scalar or complex, nested, data stored in operational systems with data lakes, warehouses, and whatnot. And we want to do that offering the best price performance at any scale. All right. But how did we, how, how is the sausage is made now? So, uh, if you look on any large service uh, or a system like a uh, Redshift, um, you will see that there are some thematic areas, some areas of focus for the service. Uh, and for Redshift, uh, if you squint, there are kind of six basic areas where we are putting most of our energy and investment. The first one, and there is a reason I put them in that order, the first one uh, in terms of priority is security and availability. Uh, usually, when I do this kind of talk in a in a in a class in person, I ask at that point, uh, you know, people to say, okay, raise of, between security and availability, which one is the most important? So, can somebody answer this question? Hello. Sorry. Yeah, I'm asking the class between security and availability, which one is the most important? Depends on your use case. No, no, it does not depend. <laughs> Security is by trumps everything. So the most secure system in the, is the one that it is down. Uh, and security is the, the highest priority and availability after you are secure. Uh, uh, so customers do, we have tens of thousands of customers giving us, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving us exabytes of data to process and, 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 and have them available, and that is our primary goal. Um, and when it comes to security, we keep on uh, pushing the envelope of the things that the customers can do and can control. Uh, there are very interesting challenges there. For example, being able to offer high performance uh, analytics on top of uh, encrypted data, to offer dynamic data masking, to be able to do identity management uh, through our systems, uh, are there are a bunch of complicated problems uh, to do to do that so. Uh, and for example, in uh, um, in a Redshift's case, all this processing is happening to the customer's uh, VPC the network, uh, uh, and the data does not get go out of these boundaries. Uh, when it comes to availability now, uh, once you get all these security features, when it comes to availability, we try to make our systems very available. Um, so uh, 
One of the biggest architectural change that Redshift did over the recent years since the inception of the service, since we launched the service, was the separation of compute and storage. So uh, when we launched Redshift, the data was the system of the point, the, the place where we were persisting the data was on the local attached SSDs, storage of uh, the individual Redshift environments. And we went through a very uh, you know, big project when we separated now storage and compute. By separating storage and compute, we have the ability to uh, guarantee that uh, the uh, recovery point objective, RPO, is, is zero. Meaning that whenever a customer uh, commits, uh, we, uh, sends a, co a transaction to commit some da data and we say we committed your data, we can guarantee that there will be and no loss of data at that point on. And once we separate now storage and compute, you can do very interesting things by offering improved availability to your systems. For example, uh, we have the ability whenever there is an environment running in one availability zone and something happens with this availability zone, we can easily, with the press of a button, move this environment, spin it up in a separate availability zone and start consuming the managed data from the point of the last uh, commit. Now we are taking this thing a step further and we are offering multi-AZ Redshift. So uh, what we do is we run two separate environments, two independent environments in two availability zones. The data gets committed and uh, written in, in the Redshift managed storage, which is essentially Amazon S3. And then we monitor the, the health of the systems. And if something goes wrong, uh, we very quickly fail over to this to the second available to, to the second environment and continue continue being available. During happy hour, during the health state, when, when the systems are healthy, the customers do get the throughput and the performance of having two environments. And when there's something wrong happens, we go and we do this very quick failover and we, we offer the, the best of both worlds, availability and good performance. Hippocrates, you said it's essentially S3, but is it um is there something special above it, S3, that you guys the proprietary redshift, or is it like like if I try to build my own version of redshift, not, not that I'm going to, but like could I do the same thing, or do you have an extra layer there that that that's doing extra stuff? So I mean, you know, redshift mana storage is the the data, the blocks are stored in you know in a proprietary columnar format. Uh, in S3 bucket, in you know, S3 buckets, right? Now, what constitutes a format is a little of a philosophical discussion, right? You know, iceberg, if you take iceberg, what is it? Iceberg is parquet at the core of it, but there is something more on top of that, right? It's a protocol yes. and manifest. In a similar fashion, uh, the Redshift Managed Storage is, you know, the data, the bulk load is one megabyte blocks, columnar blocks in S3, there is obviously some protocols, transaction processing protocols and whatnot that make make this very efficient and very performant, right? So okay. there is more to that. I'll tell you. Okay. But 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 the bulk load, like the physics, the data uh, is stored in S3. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So Okay, so security and availability are, you know, very important things for customers when they they want they are going to you know run a database, uh, and then the second area of, of importance for us is performance. Um, kind of the DNA of Redshift is to offer very very good performance. Uh, in order to understand why Redshift achieves this good performance, we need to take a look uh, a bit uh, under the hood and start look, uh, understanding how Redshift is implemented internally. Uh, so let's, let's uh, you know, in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna get into details of how Redshift is implemented. Uh, in Redshift, we, uh, we have two layers, the compute layer and the storage layer. Within the compute layer, we have two types of nodes, execution nodes. The first one is the one in, in a green uh, green uh, box there, it's called the leader node. And then there are a bunch of compute nodes that are the workhorses. They are the, the ones that are doing most of the work, whereas the leader is the, the brain, right? It, it does the, the, the brain, which is the one that gets, is the point of connection from externally to the system. And it is where the customers submit their requests, the statements, and this is where the catalog lives. 
So whenever a query comes in, you know, if you have, you know, you are taking Andy class, Andy's class, so you know all these things by, by hand, uh, we go through the typical query execution lifecycle. We take the query, we parse it, we do the semantic rewritings, we try to rewrite it in a way that we generate a, an equivalent SQL query that it is more efficient, and then we go to a cost-based query optimization based on statistics that we maintain, and we generate a distributed query execution plan that may look like the one I have on the right-hand side. Uh, there are some interesting properties in Redshift. For example, we we have the option for the custom to, to the the, key, the tables in the, the database to have distribution keys and sort keys, so physical properties. So for example, you, you may decide to have uh, to you, if you have a customers and orders table, and both of them are distributed by customer ID, and every query you have joins the customers and orders on the customer ID then we don't have to shuffle data across nodes. We do call what we call collocated joins there. So the query optimizer obviously takes all these uh, physical properties uh, into consideration to generate an efficient query, distributed query execution plan. And after we are done with this query optimized, cost-based query optimization process, an interesting thing in Redshift is that uh, for every query fragment, query fragment being something, a pipeline that ends in a stop and go operator, um, what we do is we go and generate C++ code. We almost literally open a, a C++ file and print the code into that uh, file. And we take this generated code, we compile it, and we take it, we send it down, the executables down to the compute nodes, which are the workforces. The, the compute nodes that are run on uh, uh, EC2's Nitro hardware, so we have obviously a lot of hardware optimizations in there, they start running, uh, executing this tight loop of the individual query fragments. And what they do is they, they are assigned some data partitions from the managed storage, and they start processing these partitions and, and doing whatever this query wants them to do. And we do all sorts of tricks uh, that you can read in the in you know in the uh, modern literature on efficient query execution we have uh, we do min max pruning we use vectorized avx to uh, 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 simd processing on the data we uh, we use uh, vectorized uh, and, you know execution friendly encodings compressions on the data blocks so that we can operate on apply do a lot of processing on uh, on encoded data uh, we do late materialization. We do all sorts of stuff that, in order to make this processing very efficient. Sorry, you may have said this. Are you doing push or push or pull processing? It's literal. It's a it's a push based model. Yeah, okay. So so what we do is we take you know a query fragment. We kind of put generate the for the code. We generate one executable for all the operators within this query fragment. We put them together. So it's a it's a it's a one one piece of code. It's not a staged execution, and then this the the this uh, this uh, push of, uh, piece of code. What it does, it pull takes data from uh, blocks from from the storage layer and pushes them up. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So you know, in a, you know, one slide that it is, you know, the in, by now you are experts in uh, the design of Redshift. This is a very very simple design. Are you using GCC or using some proprietary Amazon compiler? Uh, we use uh, GCC. We, we you know, obviously we test our code with a bunch of compilers, and we keep on updating that. And uh, and uh, you know, uh, that that is always an area of optimization for us. Are we have another so, question. I have a question. Yeah. Like, yes, sir. How do you distribute the table data? Like, do you have third storage and like? How do you decide where to run the table scale? Are you doing something like a Python hat to like ensure the right. level? Is so so yeah, so the way we do it is we have a, a fixed number of, of of buckets of data buckets, and then we do we do a deterministic route a, a assignment of uh, these partitions to compute nodes. And when and I'm going to talk about it later. You know, when we change the size, the compute size, then we we kind of in a consistent fashion we move these things, so we maintain the ability to perform collocated joints. Thank you. 
All right, so let, let's dive a little more into this code generation with this something that it is kind of unique in Redshift. And, and let's take a very simple example where of a query like the one I have up there that applies a filter in, two ta in one table, joins two tables together and calculates an aggregation on top of that. Uh, what the Redshift, Redshift ends up doing is it generates some piece of C++ code that looks a lot like the one I have on the left-hand side which you can actually read it, right? It opens it's a, it's a, opens a while loop. It starts pulling uh, data from, uh, from the scan. Uh, it applies a, a, a filter, this predicate uh, less than 50. It calculates a hash value uh, and then goes and probes the hash table. And if there is a match, it, match, it applies the aggregation on the match. It's a very, very simple. It's like, you know, kind of, you, you can actually read it. Of course, we do a bunch of optimizations, a bunch of tricks in there. For example, we do some, we have a FIFO queue where we push and pull from the end of the this queue in order to improve the uh, L1 CAS uh, hit rate and we minimize uh, CAS miss latencies. Uh, this version of the code is the scalar version. What we run in production is actually an AVX2 vectorized version of this code and which would have been a little more complex than that. Uh, this version actually is, is doing the late materialization and uh, does not do this late materialization and mean max pruning. We do all these things. But in a nutshell, you can you can get a, just that the feeling that what Redshift ends up doing is generates this very, very efficient uh, piece of code that uh, runs the tight loop. Okay, whenever I'm giving this uh, kind of talk, at that point, somebody raises the hand and says, hey, this is cool, but don't you worry about the GCC compiling some costs at runtime that, uh, that may, may incur. And the answer is absolutely yes. We do worry about the, the cost of compilation. But the, reason, um, the reason why the class isn't asking it because we already already talked this. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so uh, you know, the, the, to to answer this thing is you know traditionally when we kind of what we see is that uh, you know okay in workloads where it would uh, the individual queries would run for minutes or for hours you know adding some seconds of query compilation may not have been a problem. But what we see is a, a, a shift, especially the recent years, towards more real-time and lower latency uh, analytical workloads, where the potential cost of GCC compilation at the critical path would, would be a problem. And uh, in order to minimize this effect, we do a bunch of tricks. Uh, for example, just by just putting a cache of the compiled uh, uh, snippets uh, on the leader node of any Redshift computing environment. And because there is a, a lot of repeatability in what queries customers run within an environment, we were able to improve the, the hit. The, we, we were able to achieve up to 99.5% uh, compiled uh, code CAS hit rate by just putting a small CAS on the leader node of every individual Redshift environment. But we took it to the next level, you know, now that we are in the cloud. And what we do is anytime we see a query fragment that we have not seen before, uh, we, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we push this query fragment to S3. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we get, we have a farm of machines that compiles this code with the maximum optimization, compilation optimizations. And we put the compiled code in a global cast. And that we made that available to other clusters in the fleet. And uh, by doing this very simple trick, we were able to improve the cash hit uh, 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 rate from 99.5% to 99.96%. So we were able to improve the cash hit by an order of magnitude by taking advantage of uh, the, the fact that we run in a cloud as a service. And, and the reason why this thing works is because of the pinch hole principle, right? There are that many tables in uh, in the in the world that have five integers and there are that many queries that run uh, they apply a simple integer predicate on one column of a table and you know in a large service such as redshift where we have tens of thousands of customers hundreds of thousands of computing environments and billions of queries running daily the probability of having repetition is very very high 
Obviously, we do all sorts of tricks right there to minimize the to minimize the the, the you know to try to have mostly stable code, uh, stable generated code when we do this query processing. And there are a lot of details I'm omitting here. So, did you explore using LNDS to work these stuff? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that is you know deterministically the second question i get when i am in this uh, uh slide uh, so the first one usually is don't you worry about the compilation course and then the, the second question is uh why don't you use llvm for that uh, and to honestly uh you know we kind of we start building a redshift uh, you know a, more than a decade ago and that was actually kind of preceded LLVM, so we have a huge code base, a very stable system uh, that is, has has the kind of C plus plus based generation, and that's why we stuck with that. Um, Hyper paper is two thousand eleven, right? You guys started building this two thousand eleven. So, we, we we were we were already yeah. developing. And, and, uh, so I'm saying like it predates the Hyper paper. Yes. Can you please repeat the question? It's a little difficult to hear. Yeah, the comment is, if, sorry, what is your comment? Sorry, yeah, the comment was if you don't really, if you can really compile it to C++, then you should, because it produces really easy to debug. In the hyper paper, the thing was they could not convert it to C++ because they were facing issues with the conversion. Yeah, so his comment is that if you, since you can't convert to C++, you have readable debuggable code, you can in the hyper case, yeah, when you crash in LLVM land, because uh, you compile directly from IR and you're looking at assembly. So the fact that like you can you need to bug this. Yeah, and, and to be honest, uh, you know, with C++ code generation, uh, actually the developers, you know, okay, they first need to learn how the, the process, right? But after that, it is uh, quite uh, easy to develop and maintain because it the, the code they generate is C++ code. So it's, uh, you can, you know, you can reason, you can read it and understand what the query did, as we did in the previous slide, right? We, you could, you were able to read the query. Um, all right. One, one question I have is um, for the ABX two stuff. How much are you relying on GCC to auto vectorize that, and how much of that is is the right uh, system? We are right our own. Okay. Yes. You, you, have, you have the world expert in Cindy there, so. Yes. Data. Yeah, yeah, a Greek guy is uh, somewhere there. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, we are, as a service, we are, uh, you know, very much focused on improving performance. The good thing when you are running some service uh, uh, in the cloud as a service is that you can put a lot of telemetry and you can understand what uh, are your customers doing and uh, where they are spending their time and what you need to work on in order to improve their experience. And that's what we do, right? In a repeated fashion, for example, in this graph, I'm showing back what we did back in 2018, where we looked on, on, uh, on, on the fleet and we said, okay, let's keep on improving performance and, and doing, you know, start, you know, like a walk a game of improving performance in various places. And we were able to improve, for example, the performance of Redshift in, a, in the, you know, TPCDS benchmark by 3.5 times within some, uh, within a year. And there was not a single silver bullet that did that, but it was very much focused on where the time goes and fixing that going to the next. And we keep on uh, doing interesting stuff there. For example, we just released uh, like like string processing is one of the most important uh, strings in general is one of the most important data types in a warehouse. And you know we are starting now to becoming really really smart on how we do efficient uh, processing of strings. We just released some, uh, you know, we just announced now that we can get up to 64, 63 times speed ups on, uh, especially on strings with low cardinality. And we keep on innovating in this area. And can you talk about what are you doing here? Are you doing like, as you're scanning along, like, are you scanning along, you're like, oh, this is a country name. I know, I know how to like do a quick dictionary lookup on it. Or like, have, like, or like, yes, no, it's kind of obvious. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, what like in, in, for the low cardinality strings, I mean, there are you, you can do so. First of all, there are ve very many columns with low string columns with low cardinality in the world. You would be yeah. surprised how many there are. 
And if you know that you have a domain of strings that has very, very low cardinality and take advantage of that, then you can do a bunch of tricks. For example, you could like uh, you can either do something like a dictionary encoding that has low cardinality, or you can even encode them as uh, as byte by uh, and this is what we do. We use a, a dictionary, a byte dictionary in order to encode the data, and then we use AVX uh, uh, execution in order to process them very efficiently in but compressed you, form. But you're only doing this for like Redshift managed storage. Like someone does it with a parquet file that has this, this fit in and you can't do anything. So we, uh, so the answer is yes. Like these encodings are the, the encodings that I'm talking about here are on the kind of on the managed storage version, not on the external one. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, very much focused on performance. So, and this uh, is, uh, you know, you, you can see it uh, in uh, in kind of in the public domain. For example, I'm showing a graph here that uh, this is a graph we showed back in uh, at reInvent last year where we went and said, okay, Redshift provides uh, up to five times better price performance than other uh, popular cloud data warehouses. And this is an out of the box uh, benchmark. Out of the box means that we don't spend any time uh, 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 tuning any of the warehouses. We just uh, define the schemas, we load the data, and we start running the benchmark. Uh, uh, as a database practitioner, one uh, universal rule uh, I, I can share with you, a secret maybe, is that the highest performing uh, data warehouse uh, in the market is the one that it is consistently second in all the uh, competitors' uh, benchmarks. And, uh, I, you know, you can go and check which one is that in currently. And I would claim that this is recent. So we feel very well in the performance we are getting. Um, a workload that it is very, very interesting and it is becoming increasingly common in uh, warehouses right now is more near real time or operational and analytical or analytic workloads. Uh, so what we see is that customers start running uh, workloads that have higher concurrency, more concurrent uh, requests, and the response times of the individual request is smaller. And we are spending a lot of our energy in trying to improve this particular type of workload. And because Redshift generates this C++ code that is very, very tight and very small in, uh, in terms of consumption of resources, Redshift does very well in this type of workload. So in this graph, uh, we are comparing uh, Redshift against other popular cloud data warehouses in a workload that we have an increasing number of small requests, very small and short running requests. And you can see that Redshift achieves up to seven times higher uh, throughput than uh, competition. So we did all that, uh, Redshift achieves pretty good performance. And the next thing our customers went and told us is, okay, performance is good, but we would like to put more data into the system. And we would like to have also more concurrent users using this system. Can you please do something about it? And this is where uh, kind of the bigger architectural changes in Redshift ha happen over the recent years. Uh, as I told you earlier, by the way, uh, Andy, uh, I I hope I have 30 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you have plenty of time. Keep going. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, so, uh, okay. So, uh, the first and the biggest architectural change, as I told you, was the separation of compute and storage in Redshift. Uh, when we launched the service, uh, the highest network bandwidth you could get out of, uh, of EC2 was 10 gigabits on a, on a full droplet. Uh, and that was becoming a, a challenge as you were trying to offer high performance, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, high performance, uh, uh, performance in a disaggregated compute and storage environment. But as we moved, uh, you know, now to uh, in an EC2 world where it offers, uh, uh, commonly offers instances with hundreds of gigabits uh, of network, uh, now this kind of uh, the evolution in the network speeds uh, enable this disaggregation of storage and compute. And that's what we did. We separated storage and compute. And, uh, you know, you can see now that EC2 has announced instances that have 200 gigabits in a droplet, 400 gigabits, 800 and I think at the last event, we even announced an instance 
that had 1.6 terabits of network uh, within a single EC2 droplet. So we separate storage and compute, and now we are able to operate on more data within a single database. Uh, in this graph, where it's one of my favorite ones, uh, we, what we did is we, we start running uh, the TPCDS benchmark, and we scale the data set size from uh, 30 terabytes all the way up, uh, oh, sorry, from 10 terabytes all the way up to one petabyte. So we increase the data set size of the database by two orders of magnitude, from 10 terabytes to one petabyte. And what we did is we increased proportionally the hardware we were using, the compute, the size of the computing environment to run this benchmark. And what you can see is that the time it took to run this benchmark, it stayed pretty much the same, around two to two and a half hours. Even though this is not, you know, this is the expected thing, right? You say, okay, da, you use 10, 10 times, two times, you know, proportionally more hardware than the, the data set size, this thing should scale. Uh, this is a very hard engineering challenge, and we are able to actually achieve it in, in the petabyte scale. This is a very nice property. Like customers, they can use this kind of nice linearity in the in in the uh, increase in performance and scale to be able to forecast their expenses, uh, do their planning, and say, okay, I will need that. Uh, my data growth is X. That it will cost me that much, and they can do the proper uh, planning and 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 time and you know management. So by doing that, we were able to kind of solve this data scalability challenges in Redshift. The next area where we looked at was on the uh, scaling on the compute side. Scaling compute uh, was a challenge in Redshift, and we were able to address it in with two different techniques. The first one was to we implemented the ability to change the size of any individual Redshift compute environment by up to 4x, either 4x up or 4x down. And the way we do it is we bring some nodes in. Uh, as you asked me earlier, if it is consistent hashing, what we do is we take, we at the metadata level, we assign some of the data buckets from managed storage from the old nodes to the new nodes. And then we start, uh, we, we resume operations. And by doing so, we are able to increase the size of the system up to 4x up or 4x down. Uh, uh, and the customers use that in order to hand tune the uh, SLA of then individual uh, workload to, to meet their SLA. So they can fine grain tune the, the size of the environment to, to meet their needs, uh, their SLAs. And once they fine tune the environment, there will still be the Monday mornings where all the, you know, all the employees of a company will come in and start running workloads. And there will be some, you know, at some point, the system will not be able to process more concurrent requests, right? It will, it will be, there is a finite number of resources that are being used there. So at some point it will say, you know, I cannot admit any more requests at this point. Can you please wait? And what we do in order to uh, even uh, to, to solve this problem of bursts of concurrent requests was we built an auto scaling capability, which we call concurrency scaling, which what we do is the requests still come into the main uh, Redshift computing environment. But if there is queuing happening and the customer has elected to auto scale, we bring equi-sized computing environments and we start running the queries, spill, you know, overflowing the, the queries to this computing environment and uh, them accessing the data from the mana stores to keep on uh, 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 improving the throughput of the system. The customer does not need to do a single change in their application and they start getting auto scaling capabilities. Uh, there was a question. So the, the scaling is done at sort of like, like within a time frame, like, oh, I need this for five minutes to run these queries and then uh, it goes away. Like, like so again, we, we, we just got Snowflake has their flexible, flexible compute. And from what we can tell, it's doing that on a per query basis. Like, you know, you grab some nodes and run some stuff. Sounds like what you're doing here is you're, spring, you're bringing up a whole other like compute cluster. So it's not something you want to do on a per query basis. You do it for some period of time. Yeah, yeah. And it, which is very economical because now, say you have, you know, I say if it, I'm just doing some rule, uh, simple example, I'll right? say you can run five concurrent you, queries in one environment and then you have 10 concurrent. So then you bring the other. 
uh, concurrent scaling uh, environment, you start running another five. So you can actually amortize and you have more efficient uh, you know, process. Uh, uh, you, you, are, you are getting this auto scaling capability, but at the same time, the cost is... Uh, the cost remains low, right? It's, it's, uh, it does not scale with the number of queries, but it scales with the number of environments that run there and you can multiplex multiple queries within this environment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And the cool thing is, uh, you know, customers do not need to do a single change in their application. Uh, and um, in this graph, what uh, what we're plotting, it's, it's an experiment we did in the lab when we, before uh, in 2019, uh, at the beginning of the year, we did not have the ability to auto scale. At the end of the year, we were done implementing this capability. And you can see that at the beginning of the year, the maximum throughput one could get was from five concurrent users submitting uh, queries from this TPCDS benchmark, and they could achieve approximately 200 queries per hour in this workload. By the end of the year, for the same experiment, we were able to achieve over 12,000 queries per hour from 210 concurrent users submitting queries with zero think time. This emulates a realistic environment where you have thousands of concurrent users uh, running uh, using this environment in Redshift. So we were able to achieve 60x improvement in concurrency without having a single change in their application. All, the only thing that the customer had to do is to enable in a box, enable concurrency scaling in my environment. Uh, you know, this, this is a, this is a, it's a, it's a, you know, an impressive improvement in the, the throughput of a system, which was unheard of in the traditional on-prem days to have this type of elasticity and go back contract when the, the burst of activity goes down. All right. We did that, and by doing, you know, both the ability to uh, online and elastically resize any computing environment, then auto scale to improve the throughput, we were able to uh, um, uh, address the needs of our customers in elasticity on the on the compute side within a single Redshift environment. The next thing our customers said after that was, "We like this ability, uh, this elasticity, but now we would like to have separate environments." Separate, uh, you know, computing uh, environments to run, our, to run our analytics. Say because we want to charge the individual environments to different business groups, or we want to have isolation because there are we have data scientists we they want to run on their own environment and whatnot. And that's what we did. We built the ability uh, to uh, transact to uh, share data, live data, in a transactionally consistent fashion across Redshift environments. So you can have a producer environment, producer cluster writes the data. We enforce a, a snapshot isolation in Redshift and the data gets committed into Redshift managed storage. And then you can have other consumer clusters or serverless environments that read this data in a read-only fashion in a and in a transactional consistent way. Okay. And those things can fail independently and you get this isolation and you can charge back and whatnot. Uh, and these systems are, can also auto scale independently, like uh, auto scale or online resize uh, independently. And you can do this thing uh, within clusters and environments within one account or even across accounts or even across regions. We do have customers uh, that have, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, uh, business in, say, the U.S. and the Europe, and they have separate environments in uh, different regions, and they are able to run analytics uh, in their environments across regions without having to move data and build weird pipelines to move the data in one place in order to do this. Um, so, you know, building a, you know, a globe, a transactionally consistent global data sharing layer in Redshift, uh, we were able to do it and uh, customers really like uh, this ability. So by doing all these things, we're able to ad uh, address the needs of our customers in terms of storage elasticity, compute elasticity, uh, compute isolation, and ability to share data uh, across accounts, across regions and whatnot. So we did all these things and our customers were quite happy. They said, you know, they were saying, okay, performance is good, elasticity is good. Uh, still, Redshift is a little difficult to use. Uh, we, I still have to think about, have to have a dedicated database administrator to tune my environments. Can you please do something about that? And that's what we did. 
So since, you know, in a in the cloud, essentially what our customers are doing are reading some compute time. Uh, what we do is we take advantage of any idling cycles in the systems, and we try to run uh, machine learning based optimizations to take all these mundane operations that usually are, were responsibility of database administrators and make them a service problem. So what we do is we, main, we we monitor the workload, we see what the customers are running, and then we have a list of tasks that we would like to execute, to perform on behalf of the customer in the background. And we rank those these, these operations in terms of uh, priority and impact, right? The, the, which, the biggest bank for the buck is the one that it's prioritized first. So we may decide to run some anal uh, uh, analyze, analyze some tables to update the statistics of these tables to get better uh, query execution plans. Or we may decide to vacuum a table. Or we may even decide to change the physical schema of a database if we decide that the, this is the right thing to do. In order to be able to make this kind of decisions, you need to have very strong and correct uh, and high confidence signals. And we have be, keep on improving on, you know, on the algorithms we use in order to make these such recommendations. Uh, there is, for example, this VLDB paper uh, back in from 2020, where we kind of describe the algorithm we use in order to make distribution key recommendations for the uh, for the tables in Redshift. Uh, when we started this, uh, these capabilities, we were just uh, sending these recommendations in the console. We were saying to the customer, hey, you may want to have, you may want to change the distribution key of your tables because we feel that this will improve the throughput of your system, the performance of your system. As we gained confidence by getting some feedback that those recommendations were good, uh, we, we actually took it to the next level and we start doing them on the fly on behalf of the customer without asking, without, uh, without uh, having requesting the customer to take an action. So in particular, we introduce a new type of table, which we call it an auto table. And uh, what, what, uh, when the customer defines a table as being auto, it uh, gives the, resp the, the responsibility to Redshift to go and perform all these optimizations. And in this graph, what I'm showing is uh, one of, is again one of my favorite graphs. Is what we did is we we uh, the uh, we we emulated we we did an experiment where we loaded uh, the tables of uh, uh, of uh, TPCH of uh, one of the benchmarks. We loaded 30 terabytes of data and we start running this workload without doing anything else. And what you can see is that within some hours the performance of the system uh, improved by almost a 2x. It went from running to within 100 minutes and went down to running within 60 minutes without the customer having to do anything. And what the way the way this happened is was the system picked change distribution keys, sort keys, uh, encodings, and whatnot in order to bring the, uh, the performance of the system down, uh, to improve the performance of the system. And now we are taking it to the next level and we not only go and change the physical schema of the physical properties of some of the tables in the database, but we may even go and decide to create materialized views if we feel that this is the right thing to do. So what think about it is uh, if you have uh, every morning at 9 a.m. a specific report that uh, the customers are using, we may decide to create a materialized view for this report and keep on refreshing it so that the custom the, the system does not have to go and execute this query on the fly. If the customer stop using this particular materialized view, we may decide to drop it. So this very active monitoring and continuous enhancements in the performance is something that uh, again it's kind of a theme that you can see in in, in the cloud. Is in a, a auto tuning capabilities is is kind of now the 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 expectation in the cloud uh, in the cloud database world so what isolation level do you provide for the two like if user insert something to the table and they see the update immediately from the materialized view or like they only wait 
So uh, if I got so what we do is we have auto refresh uh, like we we're gonna we have a materialized views technology in Redshift is uh, we have a very wide uh, set of operations where we do incremental maintenance of those views, and yeah. for the ones that we do incremental maintenance, we also ought, we have the ability to auto refresh them. So with the combination of those two allows us to go and keep the this uh, materialized views fresh. So his question is like, if I if I'm, a, if I'm in a transaction, I do an update on something. Do you do you refresh the materialized view on commit or inside the transaction? No, no, no we don't refresh it on the commit. We, we actually refresh it off of uh, right. It's like a cron job, or you, or you, you can yeah. push, push the refresh. Yes. Yes. It's based on Postgres. So. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, like user might see some old data immediately after they insert or update the page. It's a, a, a customer might see old data, stale data. If they make a change that they expect it to get applied to the materialized view, they commit and then immediately query something that is a materialized view, they may not get back the result. If they so, yes. So, what we do is, yes. So, uh, we, we, in, try to immediately refresh the, the materialized views. The customer, if he wants to always see, the the, trans, the transactional ecosystem data they can simply run a refresh of the view prior to running the query and the refresh will become a no op if there is nothing to refresh again it's, it's not a transactional system you don't yeah it's not it's not materialized not your, yeah keep going okay so uh, another nice area of using machine learning in the database has been in the area of workload management. Like, uh, you know, if you have taken Moore's class uh, about, you know, operational uh, research, uh, uh, you know, if you have big jobs and small jobs in a queuing system, the best way to improve the throughput of the system is to get the small jobs, ad admit them as fast as you can, get them in and out of the system quickly, and then uh, uh, for some kind of queuing in for the large jobs. And this is something that Redshift has been doing for several years now. We have a very a, a simple classifier there that tells us whether a job is big or small. And if it is small, we get it in and out of the system as fast as we can. We took this technology and now we have been building the ability to predict not only the runtime of a job, but also the resource consumption of this job. So we can predict the CPU, IO, memory uh, needs of the particular job of query. And by taking using this information now, we are able to bin pack more queries into the system and get better, more efficient utilization of the hardware that the customers are running on. So we are able to Pack more, improve the, the workload admission, the admission control algorithm by knowing having this knowledge of, of, uh, of you know the, the resource consumption of those queries. Can you say anything about like what that query predictor model looks like? Like does it, does it look like Ryan Marcus's QPP net or is it something else? It's uh it's a, it's a something else, uh, but you know. We work, Ryan Marcus is working with us a lot. <laughs> Why ask? Why ask? Uh, nice. All right. So we did all these things, uh, the autonomics, uh, and the last thing the customer said, okay, we really like that, but still there are some decisions we need to make in order to size our Redshift environments. We need to decide how many nodes we, we are going to put, uh, what kind of instance types we're going to use and whatnot. Can you please make our lives easier? And they look, so the culmination of our autonomics efforts was the introduction of Redshift Serverless. Redshift Serverless is a new experience we, we introduced this past summer, which takes all this automatic, uh, you know, machine learning based uh, workload management, uh, monitoring and management, the auto scaling, the auto tuning, the auto maintenance, uh, and we kind of wrapped it around an intelligent, you know, compute management layer. So we take decisions about the sizing, the auto scaling and whatnot. We don't give options to the customers to decide about instance types and stuff. We can change the hardware under it. As EC2 hardware improves, we are improving. Uh, we are improving. So we are offering the whole capabilities of the SQL capabilities of Redshift in a, in a serverless uh, experience. And we get very, very positive feedback so far with that. We have thousands of users uh, using it. And you still get kind of all 
the SQL surface that Redshift used to ha has from you know data sharing, managed storage, also uh, integration with uh, streams, operational databases, SageMaker, Lambda, everything. So we, we did all these things. And with all these things, I kind of like try to, to give you an overview of we 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 took the Redshift from uh, and we kind of changed the architecture, or the guts of the system, and we are able to offer now a, a system that can uh, has separation of compute and storage, can auto scale, uh, has autonomics, and, and it is offered in a serverless experience. And so that is kind of the, the core of the system. The, the, the last area where we are putting a lot of our energy is in the area of integrations. So now, once you have this very strong core in the warehouse, uh, what we are trying to do is to integrate with the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, you know, uh, analytics is not a single, you don't buy a warehouse and you are solving analytics. Uh, uh, the da data life cycle is, is coming from, is, is, is complex. So customers have data in their operational stores, or they have the data, they put them in a bus, in a stream, or they just have files and they want to use machine learning on them. So th there is more to that than a, a basic cloud data warehouse. So uh, what we, we have done, for example, is on the, we have been, uh, you know, having the ability to query data in open file formats in a stream. Uh, we, we have the ability to, uh, Query also the data that uh, sit in uh, operational stores in uh, in RDS uh, Aurora and my, uh, RDS uh, MySQL and Postgres databases or Aurora Post, uh, RDS and uh, Postgres and MySQL databases. But now we are taking it to the next level. So we have uh, GA the ability to have streaming ingestion from the streams from Kinesis and Kafka, but we also introduce the the zero ETL um, uh, uh, capability where we went and we integrated with Aurora's storage layer and we can move data from the Aurora storage layer to the Redshift managed layer. And you have this uh, uh, zero ETL capability between Aurora operational store uh, and Redshift. Uh, so, and, and that is on kind of on making easy to ingest data, move data and process data in Redshift. And then on the consumption side, uh, not only we have been offering SQL capabilities, but we have integrated with uh, SageMaker, which is the suite of machine learning tools in uh, at AWS. So you can go and create models from SQL within your SQL to create a model based off of data that are managed by Redshift, and you can and those models are uh, then are can be consumed as inference uh, for inference as SQL functions within Redshift. So you can go and write SQL queries, and then you can uh, we can do select uh, select uh, something where uh, inference or scoring function from column two from table blah. Uh, so there is a lot of integration happening on, on the other side. And then at the core of it is the data, the data warehousing technology based off of uh, Redshift managed storage, separation of computer storage, data sharing, and serverless. And we, we are quite excited uh, with where we are and we're getting very positive feedback of uh, how the service has uh, changed and uh, how it has uh, it, it kind of address the the needs of the customers as they move to more more modern data data architectures. And that's what that's what uh, was it. Uh, so over the past uh, forty five minutes, I went and gave you an, a, a kind of a overview of how we have evolved uh, Amazon Redshift over the past ten years. We have tens of thousands of customers processing exabytes of data daily. Uh, we have, uh, you know, strong security posture. We are very focused on performance and scalability. Uh, and then we use a lot of machine learning in order to make Redshift easy to use, We, we to build autonomics and build a serverless experience out of that. And we have also very tight integration with the rest of the, uh, uh, you know, the broad set of AWS services. And we enable uh, integrations as well, data mesh uh, architecture on top of that. And, and we are excited for the future. And as we like to say at AWS, it is still day one. And we believe that we are still scratching the surface of what customers can do in the cloud uh, for analytics and data management in general. And that will conclude my talk. Thank you.
Thank you. All right. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, go for it. Speak on the question. So, um, does Redshift support UDF and does it support UDF calculation? <laughs> Redshift support UDF. I think the answer is yes. And yeah. for, do you guys do UDF compilation? So, so we have two, two UDFs, right? We have SQL UDFs and we have Python UDFs, right? So yes. on the SQL side, yes, of course. Uh, on the Python, we run the Python code uh, in a contained. These were PLGP SQL? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. And, and, but you don't compile that? I'm sorry. And you don't compile PLPG SQL? We do compile PLGP SQL. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. yes, absolutely. All right, that's your question. Anybody else? Yeah, and by the way, also the very interesting is uh, in uh, was related to that is uh, when you are uh, training a model in SageMaker, for many of the models we have in SageMaker, which you could have trained it in uh, Redshift data, the SQL, the inference function, what we do is we use SageMaker Neo, which is a compiler, and for the this 1P models, what we do is we generate C++ code for the model and we link it as part of the executable. So then we run filtering and predicates and inference within one C++ executable, which makes it very, very efficient. Yes. Any other questions? So my, I have two questions. My first question is, um, is there anything you've seen in another cloud database uh, data warehouse. And so we've covered in this class, we've covered Dremel, we've covered BigQuery, we've covered, oh, no, no, sorry, BigQuery, we've covered Photon, we've covered Snowflake. Last class was, was Velox. Um, we didn't cover anything from Microsoft. Is there any feature or anything about those particular systems that you thought, like, that's a cool idea? We'd like to do that in Redshift one day, or if I, if I need to cut the, the recording off, like, I can do that too. Yeah. I will tell you that, uh, you know, as I told you in the last sentence is uh, I still feel, uh, you know, we are very excited with what customers are, what you can do in the cloud. Like, you know, you know, as we learned the data, you know, you and me, we were, uh, you know, learning about databases using the cow book. Uh, yeah. There were specific rules, like, for example, you couldn't auto scale, you couldn't, there was finite set of resources, you couldn't think about storage and compute separation and all this stuff. So I, I we are very excited with, we are still, I think, scratching the surface of what customers can do um, in the cloud uh, with all these kind of interconnected services and, in, and things that can uh, scale on demand. Um, so, you know, it, yeah. There is nothing particular that you know kind of can say, oh, this is uh, you know excites me, but I, I'm very excited with you know the innovation that is happening in the cloud in general and yeah. AWS cloud in particular. I, I, I see. I, I lied. I have, a, I, have a, I have a third question. Um, do you guys use kernel bypass or anything like DPDK, SPDK? Uh, I mean, obviously, we are very close to hardware, right? Uh, we yes. we do all sorts of stuff to make efficient usage of the underlying hardware resources. And we work very closely with the EC2 teams on that. Got it. Okay. All right. Uh, and this one we cut off because um, for the video, you know, there's a, a lot of students are worried about the, you know, the big layoffs in the tech companies. Um, <laughs> Amazon is not immune to this. And I keep telling them database companies or database divisions in these cloud companies are still making a ton of money. Is Redshift still hiring? <laughs> That's my favorite all <laughs> What is it? Yes, it's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup, so y'all yeah, fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 48 gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>